Hello everyone, my name is Gali. I'm a Ika Radiology Doctor in Training. In this video, I'm going to take you through an overview of how I read knee radiographs when I'm reporting emergency department x-rays. I'm going to start by how many x-rays are taken, some anatomy recap, my checklist, and then some examples. You can skip to the section one from the timeline and I've included a link on Radiopedia to quiz yourself. You can acquire images in any way you want. However, these have been standardized to provide the best possible views. It is important to take at least two views to avoid misinterpretation. The most common knee radiographic positions are anterior posterior and the lateral. If there is suspected patella fracture, but an AP and lateral are not conclusive, a dedicated patella x-ray called skyline view may be taken. When looking at anatomy on x-ray, it is important to remember that there's so much tissue overlap. It's just like looking at a whole book printed on one page. Anyway, let's go through some basic anatomy. This is an AP radiograph of the knee showing the patella, lateral and medial femoral condyles, the tibial spines, lateral tibial plateau, medial tibial plateau, tibial tubercle and the fibula. On this radiograph you can see the important ligaments. There are two important ligaments sitting in the middle and crossing each other therefore called the cruciate ligaments is the anterior cruciate ligament ACL and posterior cruciate ligaments the PCL on the sides you have the collateral ligaments there's a medial collateral ligament MCL and the lateral collateral ligament LCL in between the femur and the tibia you have two menisci that work like cushions the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus on a lateral knee radiograph you see the patella again, femur, tibia, fibula. Superior to the patella, there is a thin structure that are slightly dense of a soft tissue density sitting in between two low density structures. This dense structure here is called the suprapatella bursa. When there is a fracture or there is a knee effusion for any other reason, this is the first structure that gets swollen up and that's where we look for a knee effusion. If this structure is more than 5 to 10 millimeters, we call it a knee effusion. The dark structure here is called the prefemoral fat pad, and this is the suprapatella fat pad. This is Hoffa's fat pad, this is the tibial tubercle, fibula. You can see the ACL and PCL here again. This is a sagittal T1 MRI showing the suprapatella fat pad here again, the prefemoral fat pad, prefemoral means in front of the femur, and the suprapatella bursa. You see how thin this is? So if this is more than 5 to 10 millimeter, we call it a knee effusion. You can see here the quadriceps tendon goes onto the patella and forms the patella tendon. This inserts on the tibial tubercle. This is the skyline view. It's quite simple, the lateral corner and the medial corner and the patella sits in the intercondylar groove. You can see how the lateral corner is more elongated and it doesn't have much bulk of a bone from the distal femoral condyle. So therefore, a lateral patella dislocation is more likely to happen than a medial patella dislocation. So first I check that the patella is located centrally and that a vertical line drawn from the lateral and medial femoral condyles are not more than 5 mm from the tibia. Otherwise, this will mean there's a tibia plateau fracture. I then check for an osteochondral defect, which is typically located at the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle, followed by medial tibial plateau fracture, tibial spines, lateral tibial plateau fracture, fibular fractures, which can sometimes be hidden, and I trace the bones all the way. On a lateral radiograph, I look for lipohemarthrosis, OCD, and I trace the bone all the way as well. On a skyline view, I make sure that the patella is where it's supposed to be without any cortical irregularities or bony fragments. So this is an AP and lateral radiograph of the knee. The first thing that catches my eye is the presence of a large lipohemarthrosis. So there's a 
fluid collection here in the suprapatella bursa. You can see how there's an area of low density, which is the fat, and the area of slightly higher density corresponding to the blood. So this is lipohematrosis. So once I see this, I know that there's a significant traumatic injury that's happened and I look carefully around the bones to look for fractures. Looking at the AP radiograph, you can see there's a lateral tibial condyle fracture and there's a dip of the lateral tibial plateau with increased sclerosis here. So this is a common injury, so a lateral tibial plateau fracture. Next case is an osteochondral defect and you can see on the AP view how there is a dip here. So um, this is from repetitive micro trauma causing injury to the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle, and you can see that here as well on the lateral view. When you look at the MRI, you can see it much better here. So this dip here corresponds to an osteochondral defect. So again, this is a AP and lateral radiograph of a knee. First thing that catches my eye is the presence of this large lipohemarthrosis, tracing the bones all around. I see this bit of irregular bony fragment that's sitting here. Um, you can't clearly see it on the AP radiograph, but there's a small dip here of um, radiolucent line that you may correspond to that bit there. So this is the lipohematrosis with this bony fragment. This is an avulsion of a tibial spine. And this is a sagittal CT scan showing this avulsion. Again, another case of um, an AVOLS bony fragment. Um, you can see a slightly um, displaced fracture with a lucent line here and a bony fragment sitting here. And this is typical for a PCL, posterior cruciate ligament avulsion fracture. You can see it on the CT here. So this is a soft tissue window looking at the knee and the sagittal plane. That's the PCM, so posterior cruciate ligament, and this is the AVOLS segment, and this is that AVOLS segment on 3D reconstruction looking at the knee from the back. Next case is a pretty much straightforward case of a fibular head fracture. You can see bony irregularity with the fibular head. There isn't much knee joint effusion there. In this case, the patient has significant osteopenia with significant degenerative changes with almost complete loss of joint space within the lateral tibial femoral compartment, extensive vascular calcifications within the distal superficial femoral artery and the popliteal artery, tracing the bones all the way around. I can't see any. There may be a little bit of fluid, but I don't think that exceeds 5 or 10 millimeters. Tracing all the bones is slightly harder to detect than other cases, but there's a subtle lucency that can be seen here which corresponds to this bit there. This was actually initially missed and um, was seen on subsequent CT scan since the patient had persistent leg pain. In this next case, there's an obvious fracture of the patella. You can see how the superior and inferior pole traction from the quadriceps tendon and the patella tendon. You can see that on the AP radiograph as well. This is another patella fracture. So starting by looking at the AP radiograph, you can see a bone fragment lying medially within the joint. There's a large joint effusion with bone fragment projected between the patella and femur. And when we look at the skyline view, you can see how the patella is slightly dislocated laterally. This patient has probably had a lateral patella dislocation, which has relocated and uh, has chipped off this fragment and this fragment from the medial side of the patella. In this case, if you follow the tibial plateau, you can see a small chip of the bone of the lateral tibial plateau. This is characteristic of a lateral tibial plateau fracture and it's called a second fracture. This corresponds to where the lateral collateral ligament inserts or the, on the tibial plateau, typically associated with an ACL and MCL and the lateral meniscus injury, or sometimes the medial meniscus injury is called the O'Donoghue triad. This is an MRI. You can see the bit of bone that's a pulse from the lateral tibial plateau and you can see that this is the ACL. It should look nice and dark, just like how the PCL is looking here and how all the ligaments are disrupted. The patient also has significant knee joint diffusion on the MR. In this case, you can see a medial femoral epicondyle fracture, which is called a STEDA fracture. Sometimes these can be missed um, or may not be visible on the initial radiograph and a later radiograph may show what's called a Pellegrini-Steda lesion is a bit of calcification 
within the proximal mediocollateral ligament here. This bone is called the fabella, which is a commonly seen sesamoid bone within the lateral tendon of the gastrocnemius muscle near its attachment on the femur. This is a lateral knee radiograph which demonstrates a fracture of the fibula and tracing the bones carefully you can see a partially imaged fracture of the distal tibia. Looking at the tibia in the AP projection in an ankle radiograph you see a, a quite extensive spiral fracture of the distal tibia. Since the proximal and distal articulation of the tibia and fibula are strong, the tibia and fibula are considered as a ring. And if there's a displaced fracture of one part of a strong ring, another fracture is also due to happen. In this case, it's called the mesonerve fracture. So the fracture of the fibula is called the mesonerve fracture. And the concept is similar to the obturator ring in the pelvis as well. In this case, we're going to talk about the position of the patella um, in relation to the knee joint. In some people it may be higher than expected, some people can be lower than expected. If it's higher it's called patella alta, if it's lower it's called patella baja and the way to measure this is called the incel salvati ratio and that's the ratio of the patella tendon length divided by the length of the patella. So if this is more than 1.2 then it's called the patella alta, it means that the patella is higher than expected. If it's less than 0.8, then it's called a patella baja. Patella alta is a, it can be normal in some people, or it can happen from trauma in others. So these are two cases, one for patella alta, the one on the left, and the other one is patella tendon rupture. It can be difficult to differentiate between two, but um, in this case, there's a little bit of soft tissue swelling in front of the patella, suggesting that this is traumatic in origin. And you can also see some irregularity where you'd expect the patella tendon to be. So if you compare this area here with this one here, there's a, a little bit more fluid in Hoffa's fat pad, which is more than what you'd expect. So that again, the patella tendon rupture on MRI, you can see significant soft tissue swelling, disruption of the fibers of the patella tendon and fluid all around the area. The next case, we're gonna talk about bipartite patella, which is unfused accessory ossification center at the superior lateral aspect. Obviously, the differential diagnosis is patella fracture. However, a bipartite patella, meaning two-part patella, is identified by clear demarcation between the two parts uh, with well corticated margins. So this is a pediatric case. You can see that the ossification center um, are still there. So that's the physis, still visible. And this is a case of an adult. You can see the thin line here. So this is quite characteristic of bipartite patella. It's in the superior lateral corner. and So it's at the superior lateral corner and the way I was able to tell that it's the lateral side that the presence of the fibula. Next is Oskutschlatter disease. Um, it's a disease that affects boys between the age of 5 to 15, especially those who jump and kick. It's a chronic fatigue injury from repeated micro trauma at the patella tendon insertion point. So you see all these bony fragments at the patella tendon insertion point. Um, this diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. You can sometimes see this in asymptomatic patients. So obviously, there's um, you can't call this Oskutschlatter disease without a distinct history. A case similar to Oskutschlatter disease, the contralateral side of the patella tendon, and it's called sending larsen johansson syndrome. Thank you guys for watching. Please feel free to subscribe and follow me on Instagram to get the latest videos. I'll produce videos to the most common x-rays that we do. I would like to thank Radiopedia for this amazing resource and I would suggest that you guys read the Accident and Emergency Survival Guidebook. Links to the book and the quiz can be found below.